بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Today we take by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa taala باب الوضوء. The chapter of wudu. Wudu linguistically comes from the word الوضاءه الوضاءته. Al-wada'atu means an nadafa it means cleanliness and good appearance. So wudu comes from the word al-wada'a, which means cleanliness and good appearance. So you say, for example, wajhun uh, wadi'un, a face which is bright, clean, and has good appearance. So what is the benefit of knowing what it means linguistically? Apart from preserving the Islamic knowledge, the Islamic heritage, it makes you think now when you make wudu, it's going to beautify me. And that is the truth, that is the reality, because we have the hadith which is collected by in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, where he said, the Prophet sallallahu said, Inna ummati yud'awna yawm al-qiyamati ghurran muhajjalin min athari wudu, faman istata'a minkum an yatila ghurratahum falyaf'al. The Prophet sallallahu said that on the day of judgment, my nation will be called forth and they will be ghurran muhajjalin. They will be shining faces. Their faces will be shining and full of light from the effects of wudu, from the places that they made wudu. So whoever from amongst you is able to increase in that light, in that shining effect, then let him do so. So we know that making wudu beautifies a person as well as removing the sins of the person. Now this hadith that I just quoted to you, the end part of it, where it said, for man, whoever is able from amongst you to prolong that ghurrah, that um, shining part, they let him do so. Uh, the scholars, they comment on this, and the majority of them, they said that this is mudraj. This hadith is mudraj. What they mean by this, that is the statement of the one who was narrating the hadith. It's not the words of the Prophet Sallallahu The part which speaks about increasing the parts where you wash, okay? Because Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, it's known about him, that when he used to wash his arms, he wouldn't stop at the elbows. He would go up all the way to the shoulders and the armpits. And when he would wash his feet, he would go up as high to the shins. Why? Because based upon his understanding of this hadith, that he wants to increase. Okay? But the majority of the ulama in hadith, they say that this is mudraj. Mudraj meaning it's a word or it's the statement of the one who's narrating the hadith. In any case, the majority of the ulama, they still say it's recommended to do so. They say it's recommended to do so, this increase, okay? But other scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and others, they say, no, we shouldn't do this. Why? Because they have the hadith of Amr ibn Shu'ayb, which is collected by Imam Ahmed and Abi Dawood, where it's mentioned, جَاءَ عَرَبِيٌ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ سَلَّمْ فَسَأَلَهُ أَنِ الْوَضُوءُ That a Bedouin Arab came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, and he asked him about how to make wudu. فَأَرَاهُ الْوَضُوءُ ثَلَاثًا ثَلَاثًا so the Prophet ﷺ showed him wudu, washing each part three times. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, this is how you make wudu. And whoever goes beyond this, then he has done bad. And he has gone beyond the bounds. And he has done oppression. So the Prophet ﷺ made it a sin, made it, made it something very bad to go beyond what the Prophet ﷺ has shown in wudu. Okay? So according to this opinion, that we shouldn't go beyond what the Prophet ﷺ has showed us in the wudu. We shouldn't do that, which is the opinion of Abu Huraira and the majority, which is the increasing in those parts. So what is the difference between the word wudu and wadu? One with the dhamma and one with the fatha. Remember back now to the chapter before, when we were talking about water. We had tuhur and tahur. So you have wudu and you have wadu. You have suhoor and you have sahur. All these words. So with the dhamma, it's the action. Okay? With the fatha, wadu is the thing that you make the action with. Suhoor is the action. Okay? In the mornings of Ramadan. Sahur is that which you are making the action with, that which you are using to eat. So wadu with the fatha is that which you use to make wudu with the water. Okay? What is the technical definition of wudu? Imam Buhuti, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the famous scholars of the Hanbali Madhab, he said in his book, Kishaf al qina he said that the technical definition of wudu is isti'malu ma in tahurin, using pure water, fi a'da'il fi a'da al-arba'ati, in the four limbs, ala sifatin makhsusa, in a specific way. Okay? 
استعمال ماء طهور على أعداء الأربعة على صفة مخصوصة. Using pure water uh, on the four limbs in a specific manner. That is the definition that we would take for what wudu means. The Imam he starts and he says, لا يصح الوضوء ولا غيره من العبادات إلا أن ينويه. Wudu is not ever going to be correct, nor other actions, unless you have the niya for that, unless you make the intention. And what's the proof of that? إنما الأعمال بالنيات, as the Prophet ﷺ said, the verily actions are tied to their intentions. So what does the intention consist of when you do an act of worship? There's two things it must consist of. Absolutely. The first thing, it must be for the sake of Allah alone. Who are you doing this act of worship for? The second part of the intention. So the second part of it would be, what act of worship am I doing? Is this wudu uh, obligatory wudu? Is it wudu tajdeed? Is it renewal of wudu? When I'm praying dhuhr, am I, these four raka'at, am I making them up? Uh, is it four raka'at of sunnah? Okay. So the intention differentiates as to why you're doing the act of worship in two ways. Why you're doing it, which is to please Allah, and why, which type of act of worship you are doing. طيب? And it must be there. What is the place of the niyyah? According to most of the ulama, it is in the heart. It's not that you say it upon the tongue, right? So the Imam, he says, ثُمَّ يَقُولْ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ And then the person who is making wudu after having the niyyah, he says, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ This is known as tasmiya. okay? The Imam and the majority of the ulama, they say that this is sunnah to say. To say Bismillah when making wudu is sunnah and it's not obligatory. They say this because the hadith, according to them, pertaining to wudu, they don't take as being authentic. Okay? They don't take as being authentic. The Hanbali scholars, the mashhur opinion in the madhab, the famous opinion in the madhab of the Hanbali scholars, uh, is that the wudu, to say Bismillah, the tasmiyah is wajib, it's obligatory. And what is their proof? Their proof is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in Abi Dawood. <coughs> Excuse me, but the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, There is no prayer for the one who doesn't make wudu. And there is no wudu for the one who doesn't mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the wajhu dalala, the point of extracting the evidence, is very clear. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Abu Dawood that if you do not make the mentioning of Allah جل, then you have no prayer, okay? Meaning that your wudu is not going to be correct. So those who hold it to be obligatory, what do they say about those who are making it in an area where the place for relieving oneself is also there? It's not separate. The wudu place, like in many modern bathrooms, also has a toilet there. They say that it's makru, as you know, to mention the name of Allah Azawajal. But according to us, wudu is wajib. So which one is higher? Wajib is higher than makru, right? So the makru doesn't take precedence over that which is wajib, as mentioned by Shaykh Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, and others. And in fact, Imam Ahmad, radiyallahu anhu, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he was asked, what should a man do when he sneezes in the bathroom? He said, إِذَا أَتِسَ الرَّجُلْ حَمِدَ الله تعالى في قلبه. He said, if a man sneezes, then he remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his heart. And that is another way that you can do it. If you don't want to say it, and you hold it to be obligatory, you can, rem you can say it in your heart. Make it a statement of the heart. The Imam, he goes on to say, وَيَغْسِلُ كَفَيْهِ ثَلَاثًا And then he washes after saying the basmallah, his hands three times. What does the hand include? The fingertip, including the nails, however long they be. Okay, so if your wife's got those super long nails, she has to wash from that length all the way up until the wrist. Okay, this is what he's referring to. You have to wash this three times. Now this is recommended. It's mustahab. It's not wajib. Okay, the first washing of the hands is recommended. But it becomes wajib at a certain point. When does it become wajib? We mentioned this also in previous lessons. Who can remember? If you touch the najasa, of course, definitely. If 
Very good. It's related to that. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Muslim, إِذَا سْتَيْقَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ بِالنَّوْمِهِ فَلَا يَغْمِسْ يَدَهُ فِي الْإِنَا حَتَّى يَغْسِلَهَا ثَلَاثًا فَإِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ لَا يَدْرِي أَيْنَا بَاتَتْ يَدَهُ That if one of you gets up from the night sleeping, then do not put his hands into the vessel containing water until he washes them three times. Meaning, do not use your hands to make wudu until you wash your, water, uh, wash your hands three times. For verily, one of you doesn't know where his hands spent the night. It might have touched the jasa. So in this situation, that first washing becomes obligatory. But in all other situations, the first washing in the wudu is just recommended, okay? It's not an obligatory part of the wudu. Tayyib, the imam, he says, ثُمَّ يَتَّمَضْمَضُ وَيَسْتَنْشِقُ Okay, then he makes madmada wal istinshaq. Madmada is to put water in your mouth and to swish it around in your mouth. Okay, and istinshaq is to take the water and to sniff it until it reaches your brain. It doesn't really have to reach the brain, but you sniff it and it goes up into your nose. Okay, using air. And then we have a third thing which is istinthar. Istinthar means to bring it out. So the madmada, putting it in your mouth and washing the mouth swishing it around the istinshaq to take the water into your nose with nafas with air the istinthar istith, uh, is to bring it out with the left hand whatever was left in your nose okay so to make the madmada and the istinshaq once is wajib one time is wajib obligatory because it's from the face it's considered to be part of the face okay and to do it three times is sunnah to do it more than once is sunnah and the proof that the madmada and the istinshaq is something which is obligatory is because the Prophet ﷺ never left it off. In all of the narrations of the wudu, it's found that the Prophet ﷺ, he did it. So the Imam, he says, When you make this madmada and you make this istinshaq, you join between them either with one handful of water or three hands full of water. So he said you join between them either with one or three. In fact, there's four ways which are authentically narrated uh, to do the madmada and the istinshaq. Okay? Four ways. So remember these numbers in your head. Number one, number two, number three, and number six. Okay? These are the four ways. So the first of these ways is with one handful of water. One handful of water, you do your mouth and your nose three times, but from one handful of water. Tayyip? The second way, with two handfuls of water, okay? You do your mouth three times, one handful of water is finished. Second handful of water, you do your nose three times, right? So that was number one and number two. Number three is that you do the normal way, which is that you do the madmada and the istinshaq, the, the mouth and the nose, with one handful of water, and you repeat that three times, okay? And the last way, which is the sixth, is that you do three handfuls of water. You do the mouth once with a handful of water, then again with another handful, then again with another handful, and then you do the nose likewise, once, twice, thrice. So how many handfuls altogether? Six. So that was one, two, three, and six. Don't ask me to repeat. Look at the video. <laughs> Tayyib. The Imam, he says, and also with regards to the madmada and uh, being part of the face, okay, if you were to do, uh, if you were to wash the face before doing the madmada and the istinshaq, that would be valid. It wouldn't invalidate your wudu, okay? Because it's all part of the same limb. It's all considered part of the same limb, okay? So if you wash your face bef do before doing the madmada and istinshaq, your wudu would be fine according to Sheikh Abdul Aziz Rajahi because he said it's all part of the same limb. Then the Imam, he says, after doing the madmada and the istinshaq, you wash your face three times, which is recommended, right? One time is obligatory. One time is wajib. Min manabit al-sha'ar. Manabit al-sha'ar, he said, from the manabit al-sha'ar. Manabit al-sha'ar means from the roots of your hair, okay? But the roots of your hair, if you're a normal person, okay? Some people have strange hairlines in the middle of the head, in the middle of the forehead. This is not considered if you're a normal person, right? From the normal hairline, okay? And then he says, إِلَى مَنْ حَدَرَ مِنَ الْأَحْيَيْنِ وَالذُّقْنِ All the way down 
to what comes from the jawline. So you have to follow the whole of your face along the jawline until it meets at the bottom where the chin is, al dhuqn to the bottom where the chin is. Wa ila usul al udhanain and also to the asul of the udhanain. The asul of the udhanain he means a part of the air which is this. This part here that if you were to press it, you wouldn't be able to hear yourself speak. This flesh here. I don't know what, if anybody knows what it is in English. Usul al udhanain. This part here, you press it and then you can't hear yourself anymore. That also needs to be included in the wiping, in the washing of the face, okay? So from the roots all the way around following the jawline to where it meets and also including that part there, okay? If you press it, you cannot hear yourself speak. And also, if you, you know, uh, unless you have a real bushy uh, sideburn, the part between the air and the sideburn also has to be washed. That's considered as being part of the face. And many people, they forget that. And their wudu is not complete. It's something which is imperative that the part behind the air, okay, that part there between the sideburn and the air also has to be washed. طيب. The Imam he says, وَيُخَلِّلُ لَحْيَتَهُ إِنْ كَانَتْ خَثِيفًا The lahya, if it is heavy, okay, like this, if it's quite a heavy bed, then you have to make takhleel. Takhleel of the lahya is that you take water and you rub into the water. However you want, this way, this way, however you want, okay? You rub into the water. وَإِنْ كَانَتْ تَصِفُ الْبَشْرَ لَزِمُهُ غَسْلَهُ But if the water is thin, the water, if the bed is thin, uh, whereby you can see the skin, then you have to ensure that you rub to the extent that the skin is covered with water. The first thing that I mentioned, takhlilu lahya, is just to get the water, okay, and to rub in like that. That is sunnah. Okay, takhlil of the lahya, doing this with the bed, is sunnah. If your bed is thin, and you're not following the sunnah of your Prophet وسلم, and you're going against the teaching of the Prophet وسلم, and the majority of the ulama that said shaving of the beard is a sin, it's a ma'asiyah, okay? It's something which is not allowed. Whether you trim it or you don't trim it, that's a different discussion. But to shave the beard and to make it whereby the skin can be seen, this is something which is impermissible according to the fuqaha umuman, the majority of the fuqaha of the madhahib, okay? So... If it's thick, then all you need to do is just ensure that the outer part of the beard is washed. If it's thin and you could see the skin of the, uh, skin of the face, then the, that needs to be washed, okay? So the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned in Abi Dawood, the Anas radiallahu anhu said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا توضأ أخذ كف من ماء فأدخله تحت حنكه فخلل به لحيته وقال حاكذا أمرني ربي أز وجل the Anas radiallahu anhu narrates as in Abi Dawood that the Prophet sallallahu when he would make wudu, he would take a palmful of water and he would enter it under his chin and he would rub it around. And he said that this is how I was ordered by my Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do so. After doing the face, he washes his hands. Now this is the obligatory washing. He washes his hands up into the elbows and including the elbows three times. The first time is obligatory, the other two is mustahab recommended. Now why do we say that the elbows have to be included? Because linguistically the word ila, okay, the word ila which means until, can also mean up and including, okay? For example, in this verse, إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِصْلَاهُ فَاغْسِلُوا وَجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ Allah says, when you stand up from the prayer, when you stand up for the prayer, then wash your faces in wudu and your hands up till and including the elbows. The ulama, they say here the ila, the harf al-jar ila, it includes because the elbow is from the same jins, the same noun, the same, the same limb as the hand, okay? So the ila includes, okay? Whereas in the other verses in the Quran where ila is used, for example, thumma atimu as-siyam ila layl like in Surah Al-Baqarah, and then complete your fasting, ila, using the same, prone, the same uh, preposition, ila layl, it doesn't mean to include, because the layl, the night, is completely different from the day, there's no relationship, they're separate. Whereas the hand, and the arm here, and the elbow, they're all one limb, it's all related. So that's why ila means, or ila includes the elbow, okay? And also the Prophet ﷺ never left it off in his wudu. Okay, the Prophet ﷺ never left it off in his wudu. So the Imam is teaching us that when you wash your hands from the fingertips and including the nails up until and including your elbows. Okay. 
طيب the imam he says ثم يمسح رأسه مع الأذنين then he wipes his head including the ears يبدأ بيده من مقدمه ثم يمرهما إلى قفاه he starts from the front of his head and he goes back to his neck okay ثم يردهما إلى مقدمه and then he brings them back the hands to his front of the head طيب so he said you have to wipe the whole of your head right so the Imam and those who agree with him, they are mentioning this because there is an opinion, and it's held by Imam Shafi'i, Rahimallah, for example, and others, that whatever part of the head you wipe suffices. But Imam Ibn Qudama in his Encyclopedia of Fiqh, Al Mughni, he mentions that whoever comes with this meaning of Daba, Famsahu bi ru'usikum, Daba, which is used in the ayah, and they say it means Daba'id, means part of, meaning that you can wipe part of your hair. Imam Ibn Qudama, quoting Ibn Burhan, one of the uh, scholars of the Arabic language, he says this is something which the scholars have never heard of before. The scholars of, of the Arabic language, they do not know this meaning. That the ba means tab'i, that the ba stands for part of. Okay? So according to Imam Ibn Qudama, he's making this statement, and he's saying that uh, Imam Ibn Burhan and others say that whoever says that the ba means, refers to only part, this is something which is not found amongst the Arab linguists. And also Imam Shawkani, he said that in 15 places, Imam Sibawayh, the famous grammarian and famous linguist of the Arabic language, he refuted this point in over, uh, over 15 places, and as mentioned by Imam Shawkani. Tayyib. So the wiping of the hair, from the front of the hair to the back of the neck, and then all the way back to the front, okay? Now the majority of the ulama, they say that you cannot wipe more than once. It's not like the other limbs that you can wipe more than once, okay? You cannot go uh, back and forth as many times as you want. It's only once. Now, if somebody has long hair and their hair is very nice and they don't want to mess it up like myself, not me, but if you've got long hair, right, and it's nice and you don't want to mess it up, the ulama, they also allow for you that when you wipe your hair, like so, you do not have to return back up. You do not have to return back up if you're fearful that it's going to mess your hair up. In fact, there's a narration in Abi Dawood where one of the companions, the female companions, Rubayya radiallahu anha, she mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ made wudu in front of her. And how the Prophet ﷺ wiped his hair was from where the parting was in the direction of where the hair was growing or moving. So it didn't mess up the hair in any way, shape or form, right? So if you're really worried about your hairstyle and you don't want it to mess up, you can do it in that manner. Either you wipe it once backwards like this and you don't need to come back forward or you can do it in the manner in which your parting is. But of course, we don't want to uh, become feminine and be of those who are always in front of the mirror worrying how we look too much. We should retain some of our masculinity and try to keep, uh, retain this roughness about us, not worrying too much about the haircuts, right? And how they look. Tayyib. What if somebody's hair is long? Do they have to wipe the hair that comes down uh, from their head? The majority of the ulama, they said no. Why? Because the word ra'as in Arabic, which means head, comes from tara'as. Tara'as means that which is ulu, that which is high. Okay, so that which comes down is not high. It's not considered as being part of the head. Tayyib? So it doesn't have to be wiped. So the imam, he said, you wipe your head from the beginning, you go to the back of the neck and you bring it back, right? He said, Ma'al Udhanain, and also with the ears. Also wiping off the ears. Now, the majority they say, and including the Imam, his opinion is that this is not something which is obligatory. It's something which is Sunnah, according to the majority and the Imam himself, the author. But the mashhur, the mashhur opinion in the Madhab, the famous opinion in the Hanbali Madhab, the Hanbali scholars, is that it is obligatory because you have a hadith. Collected by Abi Dawood with the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Udhanan min al Ra's, that the two ears are part of the head. Al Udhanan min al Ra's. So obviously, if you're wiping the head, you have to wipe the ears because they are part of the head. Tayyib, this is the opinion of the Hanbali scholars. The Imam he says, Tumma yaksilu rijlayhi ila al Ka'bain, thalathan, wa yudhilu ma fi al Ghasl. And then the person making the wudu must wash his feet up until the ankles and including the ankles. Three times being recommended, one time being obligatory. And he must rub between the toes. He must rub between the toes. Because in the hadith narrated by Abi Dawood of Laqit ibn Subra, 
the Prophet Sallallahu said, Asbirul Wudu, Yani do your wudu to perfection, complete it as much as you can. Wakhalil bain al asabi' and rub between the toes and the hands. Wabalik fil istinshaq and exaggerate in taking water into your nose. Illa an taquna sa'ima unless you are fasting. Because if you're fasting, you don't want the water to go through your nose, down your throat, and break your fast, right? So the point from the hadith is the khalil al asabi' the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to go between the toes and of the hands you do like so. With the toes, how do you do the toes? Toes you do with your khinsar, with the, the little finger, depending how little your finger is. Okay? You do it with your little finger. The Imam he says, And then after completing the wudu, he raises his head to the heavens, looking up, right? And he says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lahu, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. You raise your head up and you make this dua, okay, when you finish the wudu. Many of the scholars, they said that this part of the hadith is not authenticated, okay? For example, the likes of Imam Al-Mundir, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Shakir, uh, Sheikh Al-Albani, Rahimullah Ta'ala, and others, they said the raising of the eyes is not authentic, okay? And saying du'as at the end of the wudu is something which many of us, we neglect, myself included, and it's something which is so important. You find, for example, in Sahih Muslim, the hadith narrated by Umar radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu said, مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَتَّوَضَّعْ فَيَسْبِغُ الْوُدُوْ Nobody from amongst you will make wudu, having perfected his wudu, ثُمَّ يَقُولْ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ I bear witness that there is none to be worshipped in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا فُتِحَتْ لَهُ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةَ الثَّمَانِيَةِ يُدْخِلُوا مِنْ أَيِّهَا شَاء And that Muhammad is the slave and final messenger of Allah azawajal, except that the eight gates of heaven will be opened up for him. And he will enter through whichever one of them he wants to. So perfecting wudu and then making this, um, what? Making this uh, dhikr that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned is something amazing. The eight gates of Jannah will be opened up for you. And another dhikr which is amazing, which is the one narrated by Imam Nisa'i in Sunan al-Kubra and authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani in his Sahih al-Jami' where the Prophet ﷺ said in the uh, dua after making wudu, Allahumma aghfir li dhanbi, oh Allah forgive me my sins, wa wasi' li fi dari. And make my dwelling expanded. Give me expansion in my dwelling place. وَبَارِقْ لِي فِي رِزْقِي And give me barakah. Give me blessings in my rizq. So easy, only three words. Allahumma aghfir li dhanbi. Oh Allah forgive me my sins. وَوَسِّعْ لِي فِي دَارِي And make expansion for me in my dwelling place, wherever that be. وَبَارِقْ لِي فِي رِزْقِي And give me lots of blessings in my rizq. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we become from those who do this after making wudu. Taib, the Imam, he's going to now talk about the obligatory parts of the wudu. Okay, the things which are obligatory are wajib. Wajib is, um, it's obligatory. Okay, yuthab ala fa'lihi wa yu'aqib ala talkihi. The one who gets rewarded for doing it and if you leave it off, you are held to be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he wishes, he will forgive you. If he wishes, he will punish you. This is wajib, okay? So the Imam now, he's going to talk about the wajibat. So he says the first of them is the niyyah. And we mentioned already the niyyah. In fact, the niyyah is a condition. It's a shart for the acts of worship, right? And then he says, wala ghusl marra marra. And then making ghusl of all the parts, washing off the parts, which has been mentioned one time each. Except for what? Except for the wiping of the head, right? The head we said, has to be wiped. But a lot of the scholars, they allow also, like, you know, the kids, they do sometimes, they get a lot of water and they actually wash their head with it and when making wudu. They said that's permissible. That doesn't affect the wudu. Why? Because washing is a higher level than wiping. So the wiping is included in the higher level. Okay, so if you were to get water and wash your head, the ta'lil, the reasoning, is that the washing is higher than the wiping, therefore it doesn't affect your wudu. So, ghusl marra marra, except... So he's saying washing one time each limb, except for what? Which limb is not one time? Hands, in that situation where we mentioned, if you get up from the night, right, night sleep, then it's obligatory to wash your hands three times. And if anything is on your skin, like the brothers trying out the new fashions today, they get some Mendy tattoos, right? What's Mendy's? Uh, some kind of thing, right? 
Yehenna or something, right? The brothers are trying this out because it looked good on the wife. He wants to try it also. So if this prevents the water, if it's made of that material that it pre prevents the water from reaching the skin, then you have to remove that before you make the wudu, okay? Also paint and things like that. Unless it's something which is very difficult to remove. Difficulty is overlooked. Why do you have to remove it? Common sense, because the water cannot penetrate, okay? And in usul al-fiqh, in the, in the rules of fiqh, we have the, the rule, ما لا يتم الواجب إلا به فهو الواجب. ما لا يتم الواجب إلا به فهو الواجب. That which the obligation cannot be completed except by doing, then that act also becomes obligatory. So, unless I remove it, I cannot complete my obligation, so the removing also becomes obligatory. ما خلا الكفين so here he says, except for the two hands. Okay, what he meant by except for the two hands not being washed once only, because he started this part of the chapter by saying wash once only, we already mentioned that if the person gets up from the night, he has to wash his hand three times. If he didn't get up from the night and he's making wudu, then one washing of the hand suffices. Okay, وَمَسُرَعْسْ كُلِّهِ And to wash, to wash, to wipe the whole of the head. Why did he say the whole of the head? Why did he mention that word kullihi? To differ with those scholars like Imam Shafi, rahimullah, may Allah have mercy upon the great Imam who's, who held the opinion that you can wash only or you can wipe only part of your hair. What tartib al wudu ala ma Then the Imam he says to make tartib. Tartib means order, to keep the wudu in its order. What is the proof of tartib al wudu that the wudu should be in order? Number one, the Prophet sallam, always made it in order. Number two, the verses in the Quran which talk about wudu, if you listen to them, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu ida qumtum ila salah, faghsilu wajuhakum, wa aidiyakum ila al marafiq. Oh, you believe when you stand up for prayer, wash from your hands and to you, wash your faces and then from your hands and to your elbows. Wash, wash. Wamsahu bi ra'uzikum, and then wipe your head. Wa arjulakum ila al ka'bain, and wash your feet. So, what do you notice here? It's inaudible. What's the order? What do you notice in the order of the ayah? So you find two washes have been mentioned by Allah. Then one wipe, which is the wiping of the head. Then again, the washing of the feet. And this is not found in the language of the Arabs. The Arabs, they don't do this. Normally, they speak about one category first before moving on to the other. So why did Allah break the norm of the Arabic speech? To show you the importance of tartib. So Allah didn't put the wiping of the head at the end after the washing. So this shows the importance of tartib, okay? So this is the proof linguistically and the proof from the sunnah. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ never left off the tartib. But we did say that the tartib can be overlooked in the uh, face, for example. If you were to do washing of the face before the madh madha and it's in because it's all from the same limb. Tayyib. And the Imam says, وَأَن لَا يُؤَخِّرَ غُسُلْ عَدْوٍ عُدْوٍ حَتَّى يَنْشِفَ الَّذِي قَبْلَهُ And that you should not delay the washing of a part until the one that you washed before becomes dry. Okay? So don't delay so much going on to the next part of the wudu to the extent that the first, the, the limb that you did before that has now become dry. This is known as الموالات, الموالات, continuity in the wudu. That there has to be continuity in the wudu based upon the earth of the people, based upon that which is normally understood. So say for example, I'm making wudu outside and it's very warm and there's a, there's a strong desert wind. So by the time I've washed one of my limbs and I'm going to the next part, that first limb is already dried up. That's overlooked because that's out of my control. Also, if I'm making wudu and I'm washing a limb and before I get to the next limb, the water tanker stops, right? So I have to go up and have to fix the water tanker or fetch water from the well, then this is also overlooked because here there's no tafrit. Tafrit means there was no carelessness involved, okay? There was no laziness or carelessness involved. In any case, the Imam, he says that the muwalat, the continuity of the wudu should also be there. And the proof of that is the hadith in Abi Dawood where it's mentioned, رَأَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم رَجُلٌ يُسَلِّ وَفِي ذَهْرِ قَدَمِهِ لُمْعَةُ الْقَدْرِ the Prophet ﷺ saw a person praying and on the back of his foot was the space of a, you know, a dirham, the space of a, a coin, a small coin, which the water had not touched. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered him 
to repeat the wudu and to repeat the salah. Okay? So had it not been obligatory to have this mu'alat, meaning that all of your body should be wet at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ would have told him only to wash that limb. But because it's obligatory, the Prophet told him to complete the whole of the wudu once again, which means that his wudu was invalid because he had left a part of his body untouched by water. Okay, so this is the proof therein. We'll stop there, inshallah. And the next chapter, the next part of this, what we're talking about, we'll talk about the sunnan, the sunnah aspects of the wudu and the siwak and other things. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. Alhamdulillah.